If you were to redivide the work, let's take a look at what our production line diagram might look like with just using six employees. And let's calculate what the capacity of the of that system would be. Essentially, what I'll have is I'll have six different workstations, one after the other, all with the cycle time of 18 and the capacity per hour of 200. And we might ask what the bottleneck activity is in that case. And the answer is effectively that all of them are the bottleneck activity or none of them are the bottleneck activity. It depends which way you look at it. But essentially, because they're all even, they all act as the same activity that is determining what the capacity of the overall system is. So if one of them is a cycle time of 18 and the capacity per hour of uh, 200 uh, units per hour, and all of the other different activities are the same, then the overall capacity per hour of the system is 200 units per hour. And this would be a big improvement on both the initial system and the improved system that we had just done there a minute ago. And the big advantage of this 200 units per hour over the 180 units per hour of the one that we did a few minutes ago was that not only are we getting an increase in efficiency, but also we're only using six employees. But you would have to go back to all of the different workstations and completely redivide out the labor to even it out completely. So it would take a reasonable amount of work to do some scientific management on all of that aspect uh, of your assembly line. But in any case, we've gone through two different improved scenarios there, and that's an introduction to product flow diagrams in assembly or production lines. In this tutorial, we're going to look at a production line scenario. In this production line or the assembly line, the line is very unbalanced. And this is causes a lot of inefficiencies and worker idleness to be built into the system. And at the end of this tutorial, we're going to fix that problem. We're going to redesign our production line so it is much more balanced. So let's look at the task at hand. I've got a number of different activities here that are listed. So imagine that each of these activities, we've got a workstation with one employee being placed at it. They do a particular piece of work on a particular product before they hand the actual product down in a sequence of different activities that have to be completed before the product comes off the line and essentially the product is finished. So we can see for each of these activities at the moment we've got the different cycle time that is the amount of time it takes to do one unit of work on the product at that particular workstation. For this we want to draw a product flow diagram and that just gives us a very visual tool to work with to make the different improvements that we need to, need to make. I'm going to go over to my diagram maker so I can start making this uh, product flow diagram. And just a few key pointers first of all. For each different workstation that we have, I'm going to draw in a box. So put on. And then inside that box, I'm going to draw a diagonal line and another diagonal line to cut the bottom triangle that I've just created there in two. Inside the top triangle, I'm going to draw in the workstation number. So I'm going to go from left to right, starting at the beginning of the production line, so the workstation number is 1. Then, in the bottom triangle, I'm going to draw in the cycle time for that workstation. So if I just check my cycle time for that first workstation, it's 20 seconds. And I'm going to go back to my diagram, put in 20 in my bottom triangle. And then, in the right triangle, I'm going to put in the capacity per hour of that workstation. And the capacity per hour of this workstation is how many units of work that this workstation can do in an hour if it was not idle at all. For instance, if it was just given the next piece of work as soon as it had finished the last piece of work. So reasoning that out, if we can see that the cycle time is 20 seconds, that means that they can do one unit of work for that workstation in 20 seconds. Then we just take how many seconds there are in an hour and divide it by 20. Doing a quick calculation of that, I can see that the number of seconds in an hour, well, if there are 60 minutes in an hour and there are 60 seconds in each minute, then the number of seconds that are in each hour is 3,600 seconds. And so we divide that 3,600 seconds divided by 20 seconds, and uh, that gives us 180 units per hour. Now remember, this is just for workstation one, so the capacity is 180 units per hour. And for each of the different workstations all along, I'm going to do that exact same calculation, except I'm just not going to be as verbose about it. I'm just going to do it uh, on the fly. 
but the key number here is 3600 seconds in an hour I'm going to be using that number a lot so 3600 uh, seconds per hour that's where I got it from so I'm going to delete this uh, rough work that I've done so far and I'm going to move on to the next workstation the next workstation number is 2 with a cycle time of 30 if I check my, my table again And again, I'm going to use my 3,600 seconds per hour, divide 30 into that to get the capacity per hour of that work. And the capacity is 120 per hour. And so you can see that the cycle time and the capacity per hour are inversely proportional. When the cycle time raises, that means that I've got less throughput per hour of that workstation, which makes sense. It's logical. Between both of those different workstations, I should put in an arrow. Just to show the direction of work, that's which way the work is flowing. At this stage as well, I'm going to put in a legend that's just going to show each of the different parts of my uh, workstations. And then I'm going to continue on with the other workstations. So it works. I can see the cycle time is 20. And that will give me a, a capacity per hour that's the same as workstation 1, which is 180 per hour. Workstation 4. Cycle time is 10 seconds. That will give me a capacity per hour of 3,600 divided by 10, which is 360. Workstation 5, cycle time of 15 seconds. And that will give me a capacity per hour of 3,600 divided by 15, which is 240. Just running out of room here slightly, so I'm going to widen myself out. And then I'm just going to go to the exercise sheet again and just say, uh, workstation number six, cycle time of 17 seconds. And that cycle time of 17 seconds will give me a capacity per hour of 3,600 seconds in the hour divided by 17. It gives me 211.8. And we can round that up to 212. That's my product flow diagram for the first instance, albeit a very unbalanced and very inefficient system, and we're going to see why that is. Looking along at all the different workstations at the moment, we can see the workstation with the highest cycle time. That means it takes the longest time for this workstation to do its work, to do one unit of work. This will mean that as soon as workstation 1 starts, it will achieve what it has to do in 20 seconds. It will hand on that first piece of work onto workstation 2. Workstation 2 will take 30 seconds. In the meantime, workstation 1 will be working on the second product. It will be finished within 20 seconds again. It will then try and pass off to workstation 2, but workstation will still have 10 seconds left uh, to work on the first instant of the product before it can actually hand it off to workstation 3. To cut a long story short, and this is something that you can actually try out yourself with an experiment in class, but what will happen over a longer shift is that a long or large buffer will form here uh, in front of workstation 2. Uh, this isn't very desirable. If we're using a kind of a pull control system, it will mean that workstation 1 will be idle quite a lot of the time. But also, because workstation 2 is taking 30 seconds to do its work, uh, it will, you'll find that workstation 3 will be idle a lot of the time as well. Also, because workstation 4, their cycle time is only 10 seconds, which is even less than uh, workstation 3's, uh, that will mean that workstation 4 will be idle even more of the time. So, then the net effect is is that we we'll get a lot of buffers if we use push control uh, and a lot of idleness regardless of whether we use push control or, or, or pull control. Looking back at our exercise sheet, we can see the things that this exercise is asking for. First of all, it's asking what the bottleneck activity is and also what the capacity per hour of the system is. Well, let's take a look at the bottleneck first. The bottleneck is this workstation too, the one that has the highest cycle time or conversely the lowest capacity per hour. It is that that is causing all the problems. It's that workstation that's going to be working constantly to try and deal with all the work that it has to do, but all of the others will be trying to wait around it, workstation one and three and four, etc. So this is the bottleneck activity. Because all the other workstations have to wait for workstation two to complete its work before workstation three and four downstream can actually complete their work, and before workstation one can actually pass its works to workstation two. 
the net effect of having a bottleneck reactivity is that the capacity per hour of the whole system is determined by the capacity per hour of that bottleneck activity. So if the bottleneck activity's capacity per hour is 120 units of work per hour, that means that the overall system will not have a capacity per hour any faster than that. The capacity per hour will be 120 uh, units per second, uh, sorry, units per hour of the system. And we'll just make a note of that. And so therefore, if we accept that, then the capacity per hour of this system that we see in front of us is 120 units per hour. The next part of the question is to try and rebalance the line. So again, I'm going to go back to the diagram and I'm going to work ahead. And when I'm going to rebalance the, the product flow diagram, the key thing to remember is, is that I'm still going to have six workstations unless I'm told otherwise because that's the number of employees that I have. But also, I want to balance out so that the cycle times of all the different workstations are in or about the same or as close to the same as possible. Sometimes I might get them exactly the same, but more often than not, they might be slightly out. But generally, that will increase the efficiency quite a lot. To think about what is the uh, cycle time of each of the different workstations on my new line, uh, what the target is or what I want to get them about, what I can do is tidy up what I've done so far in that I'm just going to say the capacity of the initial system was what we found there was 120 uh, units per hour. And in this space, I'm going to add up all of the different cycle times that are there at the moment. So the cycle times, workstation 1 was 20, 2 was 30, workstation 3 was 20, plus 10, plus 15, plus 17 equals 108 seconds. That's the entire cycle times of all the different workstations added up. Now, because I've still got six different workers, six different workstations, what I should do is take 108, divide it by the number of workstations that I have, which is six, and so therefore I should end up 18 seconds. Now, this is the cycle time that I want to aim for for each of the different workstations. Looking at all the different workstations that I have at the moment, I can see that some of them are close to 18, but not quite there. Uh, but some of them are quite a far way away from 18. For instance, this bottleneck activity, I really need to do something about that. That's 30 seconds. Also, this workstation number 4 is far away from 18. But workstations 1 is 20, close to 18. 3 is 20, close to 18. 5 is 15, reasonably close to 18. And 6 is 17, so it's quite close to, to 18 as well. So really what I have to focus on is Workstation 2 and Workstation 4, trying to get them closer to 18. One of the options that I have, and that's often used, is to combine pieces of work together and then put two workers on that piece of work. So for example, Workstation 3 and Workstation 4. If I combine 3 and 4 together, I'll end up with something like this. A workstation that we'll call 3, 4. And this will have a cycle time because we're doing those two pieces of work, what was 3 and 4 together. The cycle time of 3 was 20. The cycle time of 4 was 10. So combining those two pieces of work together, we get a combined cycle time of 30. That gives a capacity per hour of 3,600 seconds divided by 30 gives me 120 per hour. Now I know what you're thinking, we're actually going further away from our target which is 18 seconds as a cycle time, we're actually putting in another workstation that's 30, but the whole point about this is, is that I can put two workers on two different workstations that are doing this piece of work. So let me show that. I'm just going to give myself some extra room here and tidy things up. I'll just remove my legend temporarily. Move up my diagram a little bit, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this workstation and I'm going to double it. That is, have two different workstations, one worker on each of the stations doing the same work. The effect of that is when work comes off from workstation 2, every second time work will be passed to the top workstation, and then every other time uh, the workstation will be passed to the bottom workstation and the effect of that on the actual overall cycle times as far as the rest of the, uh, the system is concerned is that we have a combined ca uh, cycle time and combined capacity. And the combined cycle time is just the cycle time divided by two because there's now two workers coming on it and we'd expect that we would have work coming out of this area at every 15 seconds on average. So that's the combined cycle time. 
and seconds there as well, just to be clear about it. And the uh, combined capacity is 3,600 seconds divided by 15, which is 240. The effect of doing this type of organization on our production line is that we're using two different employees, but we're getting an overall average of a cycle time that's close to the cycle time that we're aiming for. And really what we wanted to do was remove this 10 second cycle time that was part of workstation four and try and get it close to the average. So I think we've achieved that. Next problem is doing something similar on workstation two. This time I don't have to combine activities together. I can just use uh, activity two and just put two different workers on it. That will rearrange our workstations like so. And again, what we're particularly interested in that is the uh, combined effect of it. So much the same situation as the combined activities three and four when we doubled them up was we've got a cycle time here of 30. Uh, because we've got two of them, the combined cycle time is half of 30, which is 15, because that's on average what would be coming out of both of those. So the combined cycle time, again, it's at 3,600 seconds divided by 15, which is 240. And what we need to look at now is to see what the improvement of that is. At the moment, thinking that my target was 18 seconds, I can now look across here and saying that, well, workstation one is 20 seconds, close to 18. This is 15 seconds, the combined effect of these two here. This is 15 seconds, the combined effect as well. This workstation here is 15 seconds and this workstation here is 17 seconds. So I'm getting closer to the 18 seconds. Uh, let's take a look at what uh, the efficiency of that whole system is. So I need to pick out the bottleneck activity. Again, this is the activity that has got the longest cycle time or the shortest or, or lowest uh, capacity per hour. That's workstation one. So the uh, capacity per hour of the updated system is, is the capacity of this bottleneck activity, which is 180 units per hour. So that's the uh, system improved. The only disadvantage in the way that we've done it here is that we are using an extra employee. Each of these different squares represents a workstation that an employee has to sit at or work at. But if we want to keep the units of work that is being completed at each of those different workstations intact, uh, we have to probably do that. The other option is, is to try and completely re-divide the labor so that each of the different workstations are doing slightly different amounts of labor so that we can get them closer to 18 seconds each and then we can only use or we might have to only use um, six different employees but for the moment that's an introduction to the idea of line balancing and product flow diagrams